प्रेजेंटेड बाय ईबिक्स कैश हर खुशी के लिए काफी है Hello and welcome to this market special from Business Today. I'm Udayan Mukherjee with me is Abha Bakaya and our guest today on the show an old timer from Dalal Street, Ashwini Agarwal, partner of Ashmore Investments. Uh, Ashwini is great to see you again and it's been such a remarkable market in many ways. I mean it gives you this feeling periodically that a big correction is finally beginning to start but it just takes a few knocks and it's never more than a 5% dip and it just continues to move ahead uh, do you, do you think we can roll a, roll on like this for much longer like uh, just consolidate periodically and move higher and higher or do you think one of these corrections will turn out to be the real one so then good to see you again um uh, great question you know i was just tabulating it's the longest uh increase or a rise in the market or a rising trend in the market without a meaningful correction uh it's almost 18 months old uh from the lows that we saw in march 2020 we saw you know a, a correction whether you can call it meaningful or not is debatable but we saw a correction let's say from the 30th of april 2020 through till uh, 17th or 18th of may 2020 but since then and it's 18 months almost 17 months uh, we haven't seen even a single double digit correction and uh, since 1992 i don't think we've seen a single uptrend which is so long and so powerful with no pull back uh, so obviously you know it feels that the party can go on forever and there's nothing wrong and to be certain you know the top down uh, uh, news in india is actually quite energizing and quite positive uh, but uh, you know as you mentioned i'm an old timer and when i look back at the trend uh, that i've seen through 30 years of investing it just seems unreal and i think uh, that that there should be a correction there will be a correction when and how much uh, i don't know but uh, are things lining up uh, to expect a correction i think so i think there are factors uh, that are that are starting to worry me um so just to name a few you know very start of uh, very early in my career i was taught by a market veteran that uh, markets are all about demand and supply just like any other market it's demand and supply for paper and uh, we've seen 9 billion dollars of uh, new ipos already this year uh, we've probably got another 2 to 1/2 billion dollars being raised in short order over the next 3 3 and a half weeks and uh every successful ipo in my view is encouraging more such offerings to come through uh in terms of demand uh if you look at the foreign flows uh, there is no incremental net new investment coming through for a couple of months now uh even the participation in ipos is being funded from sales of existing positions as it would seem uh local mutual funds are definitely seeing a huge amount of inflow from investors but how much of that is coming into the market is uh, a question mark because the net purchase figures from mutual funds have also been fairly soft uh, so i think you know the demand supply equation is starting to get a little worrying at least uh, you know the way i look at it uh, second is that the earning season so far isn't giving you a positive momentum to earnings revisions so when pe's are already high you need earnings revisions to hold the market up and that hasn't come through banks of course uh, uh you probably going to see some some positive momentum and some positive revisions uh tech a little bit uh but outside of that there's really nothing uh so you know if you think about it in terms of demand and supply a correction looks uh, looks pot- potentially possible and in terms of earnings momentum and valuations uh, a correction looks uh, possible uh we will have to see how and uh, when it pans out and what's the event that triggers it but these are the fundamental factors in my view and the technical factors in my view that one should one has to think about right it's interesting that you mentioned one technical factor demand supply and one core fundamental issue which is earnings but as you well know that sometimes these factors by themselves while they may portend a correction they may not precipitate one quite as soon as you imagine it may come about sometimes it needs a different kind of a pin to prick the bubble so my next yeah. question is what do you think is that event which can then bring this fundamental and technical factors to bear 
on the correction that you are suggesting? You know, Udyan, uh, having seen several of these events over the last uh, you know, 28, uh, 30 years, the event which will precipitate the correction will be known only in hindsight. We will not know what caused it. We will not be able to see it coming. We can guess what this might be. It might be increase in interest rates. It might be inflation prints. It might be energy costs. It might be foreigners suddenly turning panicky. Uh, who knows? It might be a corporate blow up of some kind that we can't imagine today. But usually, uh, you know, the, the the truck that rams into uh, into the this bus is not visible. It's it's usually coming around a corner and you don't see it till it's upon you. Uh, that's the reality of market. So, you know, the way I think about it is that, yes, uh, the momentum is strong today and everybody is looking to buy. And, uh, you know, you could argue that the top down picture in India is looking extremely interesting and energizing. Uh, but I think uh, the, the fundamental and the technical factors are starting to point in the other direction. Now, how long does the rally continue? Will you see another 10% up on the Nifty before, you know, I am right or I will be laughed out of the room because the Nifty will be 30% from here? I, I don't know. I can't predict these things. But what I can tell you is that India is more expensive today on historical PE basis than it was back in 2000, which is the most expensive I have ever seen. Uh, unfortunately, I was, or fortunately, I was not around when uh, the Hashid Mehta boom took place uh, in early 1992. I joined the business in June 1992. Uh, but, you know, in my uh, memory, I have not seen valuations at these levels. Uh, with valuations at these levels, rates looking to go up, inflation being on the higher side, earning momentum slowing down, I can't for the life of me see what will allow the party to continue. Yes, more and more retail participant can continue to come in, more and more money can continue to flow in. In the short term, I may be wrong, but that's fine. You know, we, 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 we've seen this uh, before. So I think, you know, if we recognize the different ingredients that go into the mix, several of them are pointing uh, uh, in a not so positive direction. The top down story is very energizing. I mean, you know, the government's doing the right things. The policy noise is absolutely great. There are no macro imbalances uh, in the economic system, unlike in 2013 or, uh, you know, back in uh, 2000 or 2001 or 1999, where, you know, the fundamentals were in face of very, very challenging macro uh, economic. Uh, backdrop this time around that's not the case uh, so so i think the macro story is very interesting you'll probably see real gdp growth accelerate from here for the next two or three years but i think the market's been quick to discount what's up ahead in terms of the fundamental story which is why i worry right uh, so you know, most people are cognizant of the risk of a correction at this point in time. It, it comes up in conversations and the market keeps chugging along and people say, okay, we'll play along for the moment. But as an investor, how do you prepare for the event of a correction like this when the market's not given you one for 18 months? I mean, do you move something to cash? Do you tailor your portfolio into higher, even higher quality so that the knock that you experience on your portfolio is not that damaging? I mean, What's the right tactical way of allocating money at this point in time? So there are different portfolios that we manage, right? Uh, so some of these are institutional mandates, which are by definition long only mandates and have caps on the amount of cash we can hold. Uh, because obviously the client is giving us their equity exposure and they don't want us to take cash calls and uh, feed through uh, to a lopsided uh, you know, asset allocation at their end. In such kind of portfolios, what you do is uh, you probably move into areas where you see some protection. Uh, for example, utilities. Um, I mean, of course, power companies have not been behaving like utilities in the last month, month and a half. That's a different story. But uh, typically, you move into uh, some yield-oriented stocks or some defenses where you hope that the punishment will be less severe on the way down. Uh, you also kind of take money off the table where you feel that the valuations are excessive and move into, as you mentioned, higher quality, reasonable growth, uh, reasonable certainty type environments where, again, 
you hopefully will outperform if uh, the market falls off. And uh, third, you look for uh, bottom up ideas. I mean, India is always about bottom up. And, um, you know, it's interesting that even in an expensive market like this, uh, we continue to find ideas that look, uh, look, look good to us from a two to three year perspective. Uh, financials uh, is one area where uh, we've been extremely positive for the last year, year and a half. We've had a hard time holding on to uh, value stocks here. But finally, I think uh, this, uh, this, this investment should pay off. So that's another area where we are starting to, uh, to find some traction. So it's a, it's, a, it's a bit of all what you say. It's a bit of cash. It's a bit of defensive. It's a bit of quality. And it's a bit of bottom up. That's what you do for a long only uh, portfolio. For an absolute return portfolio, I think the answers are slightly different. Uh, you move significantly into cash. Uh, that's what um, you know. I would do as an individual investor. Uh, I would recommend to your viewers that please review your asset allocation. Uh, this is a great time to take it back to where it should be because you know if you started out with let's say a 40% equity uh, exposure in middle of 2020 you're probably at 70 or 75% now and it's a great time to take it back to 40% uh, even consider moving down a notch uh, i always tell people that your uh, your uh, asset allocation should be in a, in a bank let's say you are you know my age 55 years and uh, you know uh, you want to have, let's say, 50% equity exposure. You can move with, uh, in a range of 40 to 60, and this is the time I would be at a 40 and not at a 60. And maybe middle of 2020 is the time when you should have been at a 60 rather than a 40. So you know you play around with that. So I think this is a great time to be uh, to be going at the lower end of your tolerance in terms of equity exposure and and building up some cash if you're looking at an absolute return portfolio. Okay, so that helps us strategize. Ashwini, tell us where are you finding the pockets of opportunity? You know, you've been fully invested. You've definitely been seeing the potential in this market. Which other sectors? Uh, you know, you talked a little bit about defensives, about real estate through proxy plays. Talk to us what's top of mind for you right now. So, uh, you know, Aisha, I mentioned financials. Hmm. So that's one which I'm very positive on. Uh, I think, you know, banks and lenders, uh, will do very well and that stems from my earlier comment that I am very positive on India's uh, economic outlook. So loan growth which has been under a huge uh, pressure for the last uh, two, two and a half years in particular and banks which have faced uh, the, the penalty for having lent um, you know, to a lot of infrastructure companies uh, that didn't do so well and real estate say 10 or 12 years ago, they have finally provided for a lot of those assets. So I think you know, in a nutshell, financials will see three drivers. You will see top line growth because your balance sheet expands. You will see net interest income grow ahead of asset growth because interest rates are going up. You will see cost to income fall because there's an operating leverage that's embedded in the balance sheets. And then finally, you will see credit costs come down. So earnings growth for financials is going to be extremely strong, especially the banks that have a good retail franchise on the liability side. So that's one area where I think I can unequivocally say that there is value in this market. Uh, in the traditional sectors, I still feel reasonably positive about pharmaceuticals. I think there's a huge skill set uh, that India has developed. Uh, I think there's a huge compliance culture that has uh, finally been learned uh, over the last uh, decade, decade and a half. And I think it's a very important skill and we have that skill. And uh, I think, uh, you know, you are seeing some headwinds now in terms of earnings because uh, several raw materials are in short supply and transportation costs are, are high, but these are cyclical factors in my view. Structurally, this is an area which is still very promising for me. Um, and finally, uh, you know, bottom up, I would say domestic industrials because I see the investment cycle picking up. Uh, there, you know, whether it's machinery makers or, uh, you know, uh, some builders or some, some contractors, I mean, there's, it's a wide variety of, uh, of companies and stocks out there, which, which look interesting to me, uh, because I do expect that there will be a pickup in industrial investment in India. And I think, uh, some of that upside is still to be captured into, uh, several stocks. Last but not the least, uh, 
I think exporters, if you look at, uh, you know, traditional exporters in food, in textiles, um, I mean, textiles sort of had a flash of a flavor over the last month, month and a half, but, you know, it's pretty much an ignored uh, business. And I think there's a huge uh, potential out there. I mean, this is an area where India has traditionally had a lot of strength. Uh, we lost our way because I think, uh, you know, we became very investment heavy through, PA, through uh, you know, I, I think very, very attractive financing schemes that were offered by the government, which led to misallocation of capital. But I think finally we seem to be moving in the right direction. So textile exports look good, food exports looks good to me. Um, essentially the China plus one narrative in many areas, that that is where some opportunities will arise. But this will be a lot of bottom-up stock picking. I don't think this is very sector specific. What about the value end of the market, Ashwini? Because, you know, the last month, as you uh, briefly alluded to, I mean, they've been moving like rockets. Uh, you know, some of these traditional utilities, I mean, the NTPCs, Coal Indias, and even the ignored ITC moved up 40, 50 bucks. I mean, uh, do you see this kind of momentum continuing in that, that end of the market? So, uh, then no, ut ut utilities is a space, especially coal-fired utilities, I, I, I worry about them because I think... Uh, climate change and ESG concerns are, are for institutional investors are here to stay. Um, I, I see the debate, uh, which is that a poor country like India should continue to be able to burn coal and provide uh, the electricity to its businesses and to its consumers. Uh, we are still very early um, in the cycle of development to be able to afford alternative energy. But I think climate change is upon us. I mean, what you've seen in Uttarakhand last week um, is not pleasant. And uh, we've seen unseasonal rains, floods with increasing frequency. I mean, whether a country is poor or rich, it doesn't matter. We do need to take cognizance of climate change and it's upon us. So unfortunately, coal-fired uh, energy is not something that excites me. Um, uh, so some of these value pockets uh, that uh, you, you spoke about uh, to my mind, are uh, not uh, you know something that that we would invest in, but partly these are ESG related as well, um, uh, rather than a pure value or a bottom up uh, investment. I think there are ESG concerns uh, that hold me back in some of these instances, without taking specific stock names. Well, you were speaking about earnings and financials just a while back, and uh, you know ICICI Bank has got such a great response from the market after its earnings. But conversely, the other pocket, which you would presumably own, because all large uh, investors own a slice of uh, the IT sector, that did not get a great response after the TCS results. Uh, would you worry about that front, the traditional software services companies? Or do you think if a correction were to come about, you would seek refuge in some of these really strong balance sheets, strong management kind of companies? Um. It's not a very straightforward answer, but let me try and uh, share at least how I think about it, right? Uh, IT services has been doing very well for the last uh, 15 or 18 months in terms of stock price performance. If you look at several stocks, they are trading at valuations we haven't seen uh, for the last nearly 20 years. For sure, Infosys was more expensive back in 2000. Uh, on 99, but since that point, we've never seen uh, IT stocks trade at the valuation that they're trading at. Uh, some of the mid caps are trading, you know, at 60 times 12 month forward earnings. Uh, IT services business are seeing a great tailwind right now. Everybody needs to be, um, you know, mobile, uh, be able to access data and applications on the cloud, whether you're a company. Um, and it's your internal users, or if you're a customer facing business, it's your customers. So, and that migration was suddenly forced upon everyone by COVID. So, you know, suddenly everybody's seeing more business than they could handle. Uh, so these valuations have shot up. Now, as a value investor, my suspicion is that the valuations are excessive in the IT services space, and I wouldn't want to uh, necessarily be significantly overweight the IT services sector. But as you mentioned, this is also an area which has very high quality attributes, uh, conversion of EBITDA into cash, 
generally speaking, these companies are very well run. They have very high levels of governance. Um, they, you know, the balance sheets are squeaky clean uh, for obvious reasons. So many of them offer uh, very attractive dividend yields uh, relative to other stocks uh, uh, that we have in India. So in a down, uh, in a in a down leg. I would argue that the large cap IT would probably be a store of value. I'm not so sure about the smaller companies because valuations are a little more challenging there. But I think the large cap IT would definitely be a store of value in a down leg. They, they would probably outperform a, a, a sell off in the market. Okay, let me toss a difficult question at you because it's almost impossible to answer the nature of the correction that we have discussed in this show. If you had to guess, and it can only be a guess, uh, what do you ex expect to see in the term of the texture of the correction? I mean, it could be a sh short, sharp, brutal 15-20% kind of fall rattling investors, but then the markets might quickly find their feet once again and continue to rally on. Or it could be a you know the correction that we saw post 2017-18, where mid caps went into a hole for a couple of years, and most portfolios underperformed the Nifty, uh, and it took time to work its way the, for the market out of that hole. Uh, if you had to guess, which one of the two are we going to be closer to? I think, it, like like you said, it's a guess, right? Um, I am no soothsayer, so. Uh, I think it would be the first, not the second. And the reason I say it is this. Uh, 2018 to 2020 middle or 2020 late was a very challenging time for India. Uh, we were still experiencing the aftershocks of demonetization and introduction of GST. Uh, GST introduction was, uh, you know, very challenging for a lot of players. It was very difficult uh, to, uh, to, 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 to adapt to, at least in the initial uh, phases. And immediately in 2018, you were presented with a sort of a mini crisis in the financial world with the collapse of ILFS, which uh, was closely followed by uh, the bankruptcy of Divan Housing and Yes Bank. Uh, so, you know, what happened was uh, multiple factors. Uh, so you had, uh, you know, a reasonably scared investors because, you know, you had accidents going on, you had no earnings growth. And by the time you started getting your head wrapped around all these challenges and started to come out of it, which was towards the end of 2019, you were presented with a pandemic uh, like COVID. So these are these are events which are very large tectonic shifts in how uh, you uh, you know how how you how you look at uh, look at history in in uh, in market cycles, right? These are they're very very large events and very large events uh, compressed in a fairly short time cycle of four or five years. I mean, these are all kind of kind of. Uh, events that we'll probably talk about 10 or 15 years from now, these are not some things that we can forget. Uh, my sense is, as I mentioned, that the policy direction, the policy narrative is very positive. My sense is there are no dangers in bank balance sheets. The financial system is quite strong. After all, the cleanup and the dusting and the polishing that has happened over the last 10 or 15 years. My sense is that there is a strong underlying demand that is there in the economy, uh, which will come back, assuming there is no significant third wave, which is the base case we are working with at this point. If you take all of these, then I think the core economic uh, outlook is, uh, is not impaired, is not damaged. There is risk of inflation and rates. That's something that we'll have to work through. A moderate inflation and some increase in interest rates is possibly not bad. It can uh, lend to best, better nominal growth and better earnings growth. Uh, interest rates and inflation tend to be destabilizing only when CPI goes into the double digits and starts to hurt demand in a significant way. I don't see that happening, or at least I hope that doesn't happen uh, in the near future. So if I put all of this in, the, in a mix, what I'm really saying is that, look, we are in a very, very good place from a macroeconomic perspective. Uh, this is also the first time India is seeing good amounts of risk capital that can finance ideas 
release productivity gains in the economic system that we haven't seen. It can help grow a thousand new entrepreneurs. Um, and something like this, we haven't seen in our history, you know, the abundance of risk capital. So on a macro basis, I'm very positive. I'm wor worried about the valuations being stretched and in the short term, the earnings momentum slowing down quite significantly. So the event could be something outside of India, the event could be something within India, I can't predict that. But I do expect a short, sharp correction and uh, which will bring hopefully valuations down to a more reasonable level. And then, you know, we start uh, building in better, better fundamentals going ahead. That's how at least I think about it. But, you know, then markets always surprise all of us. Uh, this may sound very logical and very nice and very easy to deal with, but I can tell you that I will not be able to guess what causes the market to go down and what kind of ripple effects it causes. You know, if something large blows up, a large company blows up or a large bank blows up or something happens in the macroeconomic system that uh, we, we don't know, all bets are off, then, then you have to uh, have to regroup and rethink. Uh, let's go back to 2008. And 2008 is very instructive, right? 2008, we had no macroeconomic imbalances. You had very solid domestic demand. You had uh, very solid, uh, you know, current account uh, balances. Uh, fiscal deficit was at decadal lows. There were no problems. Lehman happened. We had all the money in the world domestically to be able to ride out the Lehman problem. So you had a very strong bounce in 2009 and 2010. And what happened was that we took our eye off inflation which led to a massive amount of um, uh, imbalance in the system because demand grew far faster than what the supplier response could be, resulted in a massive amount of current account deficit and fiscal deficit, which culminated in the depreciation of the rupee in the middle of 2013. So I hope uh, that you know, we won't have the same level of macroeconomic imbalance building up and that's my hope, uh, but this is how I see the future going. Fair enough, uh, Ashwini. Great talking to you as always. Thank you very much for your time today. But it was wonderful catching up on the markets again. That Thank you again. Thank was you. our market guru for this week. We shall return next week as always with another voice for, of experience from the stock market. Till then. <laughs>